When you embrace anybody, when you accept somebody, when you include somebody, it's a pretty powerful thing. When you exclude or reject somebody, it can damage your person pretty deeply. When you say, come on in, there's room for you, that's life. In the Bible, the word hospitality is a spiritual gift. It was crucial to survival in the ancient world. And the biblical definition of hospitality is making space for someone you don't have to make space for, which is why you're all here. God made space for people he didn't have to, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And boy, when I say that, social media lights up from people that have a following of seven because they don't want you to make space for people not like you or that you don't like. And yet the whole story of creation is about God making space for people he didn't have to. If you want to know why the average church has messed up people in it, it's simply because God made space for people he didn't have to. And I'm awfully glad that he did. That's a great definition. And when it happens, it produces life. When it doesn't happen, when somebody's unwanted, rejected, ignored, or excluded, the result is that person dies a little bit. And that's going to bring us to a pivotal moment in the New Testament in the Church of Acts, but also literally in human history. It involves a man named Peter and another guy, a Roman soldier, a Gentile named Cornelius. Now, I actually want to put this in a theological context, so let me slog through, just briefly, a little bit of material. So this goes all the way back to creation. In Genesis 1, we're told that in the beginning, the earth was formless and void. It's kind of a picture of cosmic goop. Everything is all jumbled up together, chaos and disorder. And part of what God does is that he begins creation by separating things. God saw the light, it was good. God separated the light from the darkness. Then God made the expanse of the sky, and God separated the water under the expanse in the sea from the water in the expanse, the moisture from above. Later on, God said, let there be lights in the sky to separate day from night, to mark seasons and days and years. So God draws boundaries. God makes distinctions. God establishes these wonderful separations that make creation pretty fascinating. Light from dark, ocean from ground, earth from sky, day from night, UT from A&M. God draws all these boundaries and he separates. But then God binds them together in ways that bring harmony and delight and create seasons and days and years and ecosystems and microclimates. And God, from this messy, chaotic, cosmic goop, brings order and value to creation, a distinction. And so he's bringing order out of chaos. Then at the very climax of creation, he creates human beings, and then he separates us. He makes us out of the dust of the ground, but he separates us from it. So we're not dirt, but we're connected to the earth to be stewards of it, to care for it, to treasure it. We're connected to God, but we're not God. We're made to be bearers of his image. We're all distinct from each other. I like to say if two of us are identical, one of us isn't necessary. And yet religion loves to clone, just like different groups, different political parties, all kinds of people, nationalities, always want to clone you. And I always say, get your hands off of me. You are unique, you're an individual, no two thumbprints are alike, I'm not going to join your club. And so when you come into the body of Christ, everybody wants to make you Oldsmobile, Cadillac, Chevrolet, Mercedes, whatever it is, and I tell you, I beg you, don't let people brand you, and don't let people force you to conform into their mold. God transforms us, he doesn't conform us, he loves diversity, he loves it. That's what makes the world go round, that's what makes life exciting, diversity. How many people I've learned from, from different nationalities, my international travel, different races, different culture, has made me a bigger person. When I married my wife, you know, she had never been out of town. I said, baby, I'm going to give you a worldview. And her whirlwind life began 
in the cockpit of my airplane going around the world, and she saw stuff a little North Carolina girl never saw in her life. And she saw people and heard people, and it opens your perspective. That's a good thing. You live in a little closed environment, you live like a pygmy, like some old redneck in the South that I grew up with. Never been out of town, doesn't, doesn't know how to play a CD player. You need a bigger life. And church can get just that narrow and just that exclusive. So God creates human beings and we're distinct from each other, but we're made to be connected to each other through community. For example, God says a husband shall leave his father and mother. And I know some parents are probably hoping that'll be true. <laughs> and cleave to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Although they're different, they become one. He makes human beings, male and female, they're different. Aren't we glad? You see a man and a woman standing at a church altar or platform, and in spite of their differences that are unique, they pledge oneness to each other. And there's a connection there. And you marvel at the wonder of creation. God separates light from dark, day from night, ocean from dry ground, earth from sky. Then God connects and binds together. And that goes to the core of creation. There's a warning attached to all the separating and joining together. In Matthew 19, verse 6, when Jesus is talking about marriage, he says, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Matthew 19, verse 6. And one of the ways you can think about sin is that sin is always trying to join together what God separated, and it's trying to separate what God joins together. It's failing to acknowledge and live in harmony with God's creative intent. So that's the very first sin, Eve's temptation. The serpent comes and says, go ahead, eat from the forbidden tree, cross that boundary, because when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Now, you're not supposed to be God, but the enemy says, well, you can be kind of almost like God, and it creates a mess and it puts us in a moral chaos and confusion, a moral, social, relational goop where there are no longer distinctions that there ought to be, like the one God made between he and us. And there are no longer connections between us and him like they ought to be. We're not good stewards of the earth. We pollute it. We mess it up. We mess with Texas. We don't live in submitted humility to God nor to each other. We try to dominate each other or other people. We don't honor the differences or we exclude that race of people or that group and we withdraw from them. So God goes again to start over with a guy named Abraham and the people of Israel. And God says, I want you to come out and be separate. I want you to be holy. And understand, holiness is not a stern, forbidding thing. To be holy at its core simply means to be separate. I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. I can hang with you. Jesus hung out with sinners. But his thinking process, his attitude, and his behavior was completely controlled from within. So I'm in the world. Enjoy the world. But I'm not part of its value system. Does that make sense? Some of, I mean, there are some groups, you ought to go be in a monastery, you know, clone, get away, cloister yourself in a little cocoon. And Jesus said, don't do that. Go into all the earth. Go into all the world. Pollinate this thing. Be, be like leaven, you know, spread everywhere. Like some of you do when you're sick and you come in and you, you <laughs> spread it everywhere. So that goes back to God's creative intent for existence. God said, I want you to leave your land, Abraham, your family, your culture, your family's gods. I'll teach you the right way to live. You'll be separate, and then you'll be connected to the whole human race. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, verse 3. So God says, I want you to be separate, not so much from everybody, but for everybody, so that one day the whole world can be in my embrace, can be included. He says, the day is going to come. When anybody in the world who wants to come into my family can. That was unheard of. That was shocking. So, if you've read through the Old Testament, there are a whole lot of rules about separateness. It's as if God has to teach people who have been living in moral chaos in this ancient world with no law, no Bible, no nothing. The idea of separateness. He's got to teach them. So he starts off training a whole lot of laws. Touch this, don't touch that, eat this, don't eat that, wash this, don't wash that. But when Jesus came, he saw clearly that it was never about an external rule or mechanical obedience. The heart of God was always, I am the Lord your God, therefore consecrate yourself and be holy because I'm holy. 
honor the distinctions and connections I've built into creation. So over the centuries, Israel lost the big picture, as religious people always do, and as you and I tend to do. So one day, Jesus comes and tries to explain this confusion to the people. And at that time, religious people thought of holiness as being exclusive. They would exclude people. They would shut people out. They would not associate with women, not associate with tax collectors, not with lepers, nor with Samaritans. And they wouldn't associate with a leper because they were considered unclean. They wouldn't associate with people who didn't follow their dietary laws. They wouldn't associate with people who didn't wash right. They wouldn't associate with people like tanners who followed what rabbis called despised trades because tanners touch dead animal skins and it made them ceremonially unclean. So the Pharisees would have nothing to do with them. And they wouldn't, I think I said they wouldn't touch a Samaritan. They'd detour around the whole country out of the way just so they wouldn't have to be near these people. <coughs> they wouldn't touch them. They would exclude things and people. Exclusion, exclusion, exclusion. They thought that made them holy. They thought that brought delight to God. They were really screwed up, all right? And then Jesus said, are you so dull, dumb, can't think, can't hear? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from outside can make them unclean? Like pork sausage? <coughs> Couldn't eat in Old Testament. You can eat all you want now. So he says, for from within, out of the heart, come the evils that make a person unclean. It's not what you wear or eat on the outside. It's what's on the inside. Okay? But we still love the outside, don't we? Man, do we ever. And so <clears throat> those are the evils that make us relate to the earth and to God and to other people in the wrong way. Excluding people, shutting them out, having contempt, judging them, avoiding them. Well, the Pharisees thought that was their greatest virtue. Their behavior, they thought, would be pleasing to God. And in Jesus' eyes, it was their biggest sin. That was the sin he had yet most upset about. And the very people the Pharisees excluded, well, Jesus would embrace. They shut them out. He brought them in. What happened to the church? We don't like bad people. The truth is, everybody in this room is bad. Yeah. In fact, we're going to show a video of all of you in just a second. <coughs> Thank God. That'll never happen. Jesus would tell these people, come on in. There's room in my kingdom for you. There's room in my heart for you. He makes space for people he didn't have to make space for. And you can't do anything about it. But ignore it, hate it, reject it, but it still stands true. The glory of creation is about God making space for people he didn't have to. That's what creating the heavens and the earth is about. God making space. Peter and the disciples watched Jesus doing it, and they noticed something very odd. Jesus was clearly the holiest man they had ever met. Nobody knew God like he knew him. He embodied a love and a purity they had never seen in a human being. At the same time, he was the most inclusive, approachable person they had ever met. In fact, the worst thing the Pharisees could say about him was he was a friend of sinners. He likes bad people, and it drove them crazy. And that rocks their world, violates their internal wiring. After the resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes to bring a brand new error to Jesus' community, a new covenant. And now everybody's going to be welcomed into Jesus' family. And the disciples have no idea how much this is going to mess up their mind. So one day Peter meets a man named Cornelius. He's a Gentile, a pagan. And if you were a devout Israelite, you wouldn't have anything to do with a Gentile. You thought that made God happy. A devout Israelite would pray every day, Blessed art thou, O God, who did not make me a Gentile. Can you imagine praying that prayer? Pick whatever nationality you want. Oh, blessed art thou, O oh God, who did not make me like them or those people. Gag me. And there are people that still say that. Gentiles were despised so deeply, a rabbinic teaching said you should never help a Gentile woman who's giving birth because that meant another Gentile's coming into the world. Another one of them? We don't need any more of them them don't help them into the world and Cornelius is one of them worse he's a Roman soldier 
These were the people oppressing the people of Israel, of Peter. He's somebody to be excluded, shut out. Don't talk to him. Don't touch him. Nothing. And then God says to this Gentile pagan, for some of you that don't believe God can talk to somebody who's not a Christian, Cornelius, I've heard your prayers. I know your heart. There's room in my house for you. So send some of your men down to Joppa to a guy. He's got a lot of problems. He's one of the leaders in my church. He's kind of screwed up, but don't worry about it. Send your guys down there and find this guy named Simon Peter, and he's going to give you some instruction. And then God has to call time out and run down to figure out how to fix Peter because Peter is definitely a redneck, racist bigot, okay? He got a, you know, he's got a gun rack in the back of his pickup, four by four, Bud Light cans in the floorboard, fuzzy dice on the wind. You could just see old, old Pete, yeah. And he's listening to Alabama on the radio, play some old hits. All right. Well, I mean, this is the, what the kind of guy he was. You got to get a good picture. Do you, have you ever watched Deadliest Catch on TV? Do you think these guys are clean, scrubbed, and pretty, and ready for a stained glass window? These are pretty foul guys, tough as nails as sandpaper. Well, Peter's a fisherman. What do you think? He goes, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I wonder where are people's brains? These are people you would never pick. They are the worst. This would be like a Hartley Davidson game, bikers. Can you see them singing? Hold me close, put your arms around me. Men wouldn't sing that. And these are, these are the kind of guys that are there. This is for all you unchurched men out there, okay? I'm with you. One of the reasons I never liked church. So uh, the last time the town of Joppa was mentioned in the Bible, it's about a story of a man named Jonah. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They were the enemy of God's people, a bunch of pagan Gentiles. And Jonah did not want to go down and preach good news to these people and get them to know God. Preach, eat, and talk with a bunch of pagan Gentiles, not a chance. And the story of Jonah is a story about racism and exclusivity. Don't want to have anything to do with these people. So God speaks to Jonah. Shouldn't I care for Nineveh? Jonah says, nope, you shouldn't care for Nineveh. It's nice to have leaders in the church like this, isn't it? And what happens to Jonah? He gets swallowed by a great fish. Then he prays. Oh, does he pray. Have you ever read Jonah's prayer? Oh, God, I'll do anything. Get me out of this great fish. And please, let me go out the same way I came in. That's how I would have prayed. Jonah never really comes to grip with what God's saying. Now, God comes to Joppa again, and he wants another Jewish man to bring a word of repentance to a Gentile. This time it's a guy named Peter. And by the way, does anybody know what the name of Peter's father was? Blessed are you, Simon Peter, son of Jonah. Peter was spiritually a son of Jonah in a lot of ways. It's a Jonah story all over again, but this time the Holy Spirit is involved. In Acts 10, we're told Simon Peter is staying at the home of another man named Simon the Tanner. Why do you think Luke tells us he's a tanner? Because lines are being crossed. It's a little like in the Old Testament. God's trying to teach the people about separation. You know, when your kids are real little, you put training wheels on their bike. But there does come a day when you grow up and mature, and the training wheels come off. When you're 25 years old, you look kind of stupid riding around with training wheels. So when Jesus comes, it's like, okay, there was a time you needed to learn about separateness, because there was so much moral goop in the world. But now it's time for the training wheels to come off. Now it's time to grow up a little bit. Simon Peter is at the home of Simon the Tanner. It's lunchtime. He goes up on the roof. He falls into a trance. And God gives a vision to him and lets down a sheet with unclean animals to a Hebrew. And God says, rise, take and eat. And Peter refuses. And three times God has to come back to him and say, what God has cleansed, don't you call unclean? And he keeps thinking, I am not going to do this. So in this dream, God is saying to Peter, you've been thinking about separation and what makes an animal clean or unclean. And you've been thinking about which people are clean and which people are unclean. And on a deeper level, you've been thinking about who ought to be avoided, who ought to be excluded, who we shouldn't touch. 
So three times old Pete has this vision. Then the men of Cornelius come to the home where he's staying. They tell him that God has spoken, that they were to come seek him out, that he's to come with them and proclaim some good news about Jesus. And in verse 23 of Acts 10, then Peter invited them into his house to be his guest to show them hospitality. He's making space for people he doesn't have to make space for, Gentiles. And in the ancient world, hospitality meant you and I are connected. There's room in my heart for you. It's a statement of affiliation. And that's what got Jesus into so much trouble. He chose the wrong people to eat with. They tell Peter and Cornelius about his hunger for God. They, they talk about Cornelius got a good heart. He doesn't have any information yet, truth that makes you free, but he's a seeker, and that God's spoken to him. So old Peter goes to Caesarea, knocks on Cornelius' door, and Cornelius answers and said, hey, come on in. Now there's an open door. There's a man on the other side of it. I think it's one thing to exclude people as a group or abstractly. It's another thing when you look somebody right in the face, right in the eye. That's why it's so important to look people in the eye. That's why it's important for people in a church to get out of the church and have relationships and contact with people who are far from God. That's their only hope. Yet we stay cloistered in our little cocoon. Cornelius says, come into my house. How many times do you think Peter's ever been invited into the house of a Gentile? Zero. Not a chance. Never happened. That's to be unclean. That's to embrace somebody you don't want to embrace. That's scary. That'd be like a Ku Klux Klan guy knocking on the door of an African American before civil rights, saying, come on in. It's shocking. Or a, a, a German Nazi and a Jewish man. As shocking as that is, it's that shocking at this time in history right now. And God says, get your ugly self in that house. There's a person with an eternal destiny there. Oh, and it kind of turns out to be Peter. You're going to talk about conversion? I think Peter's getting the biggest deal out of this whole deal. He's getting converted. So Peter goes in, verse 25. He goes through an open door, and the world's never going to be the same again. He tells Cornelius, here's the good news. A man named Jesus came, sent by God. He went around doing good, healing people. He was crucified for our sin on a cross one day. Then he rose from the dead, and I was there, and I saw him. I touched him. I ate with him. I was with him for three and a half years. Now he's alive, and forgiveness of sin and newness of life are available to anybody who wants it, publicans and Pharisees, everybody. We all thought it was just for us as Jewish people, but now I'm starting to find out it was for everybody. Why, who would have thought that? And we're told that while Peter is preaching this good news to this crowd, the Holy Spirit comes, and he falls on everybody. And you're thinking this is only for us Jews the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, without invitation, without an organ playing, hallelujah, he just comes. One thing about God, he just does what he wants to do. You say, well, I, he can't come unless he comes as a Baptist. Well, he can't come unless he comes as a man. He just comes in combat boots. He just comes the way he wants to come. There ain't nothing you can do about it. He slams in, knocks them all down. They speak in tongues, and they said, now, the last time we saw this, this was just for Hebrews in an upper room. These are pagan Gentiles. I can't believe God's letting them in. But he is. It's undeniable. So, now Cornelius is going to come in, and now the Gentiles are going to come into the family of God for the first time. Then we read this fabulous statement from Peter. Then Peter began to speak. Now I realize how true it is. God does not show favoritism, but accepts people from every nation. I had no idea. I had no idea, Peter says, how good God was. Acts 10, verse 34. And we call this the conversion of Cornelius, but I think it's Peter who gets converted. He realizes God's a lot bigger than I ever thought and a lot better than I ever thought. He's a very good God. I thought he was pretty narrow. I was interviewed by a Christian magazine 10 years ago, and they said, as you've gotten older, and if I was older 10 years ago, God help me now, you know that. They said, as you've gotten older, do you think you've gotten more liberal? I said, let me tell you what I think. I think I now see God a lot bigger than I did when I was younger. I had a small, narrow God. And the more I read the Bible and the more I saw what God did, I said, holy cow, he's a lot bigger than my seminary professor ever dreamed. Right. And I'm saying, that's a good thing. What is it that makes me grow? Expands my worldview. God's a big God. Nothing intimidates him. So there had been prejudice, exclusivity, 
and racism inside of Peter, and now God's chipping away at it. He's walked through a door. Now the training wheels are going to come off. Now the church is really going to start to move. And that happened. And by the way, you can walk around this city or any city USA. That's a black church. That's a white church. That's a Hispanic church. Oh, let's go to L.A. That's a Korean church. Uh, that's, a, that's a Republican church. That's a Democrat church. That's a Tea Party church over there. And I thought, God must get sick to his stomach thinking, I didn't die for a Republican or a Democrat church. I didn't die for a race. I died for the world. You got into your race by a physical birth. I had nothing to do with it, neither did you. You get into the family of God through a spiritual birth. And so flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. So he says there's no Jew, no Gentile, no Baptist, no assembly of God, no male, no female in the body of Christ because I got all that from a physical birth. And so God says flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. You must be born again, and it's by God's Spirit. And so in this church, the body of Christ, there is no race, no nationality. You know, I've invited how many great African-American preachers. I've even had some from our city, one who's died, who is a, a friend. I've never been invited to one. Yeah, they're going to preach on racial reconciliation. Give me a break. Give me, I'm not one cracker in the church. <laughs> you know why? They preach exclusivity. You say, you're going to get in trouble saying that. Bring it on, baby. You bring it on. You, show, you bring the word of God when you come to me. This is for anybody. We got Filipinos sitting here who have preached to you from this place. We've got people from Korea. We've got African-American people. We've got people from Nigeria. And they've all been on this stage. They're on my staff. They're on the board. They're all over the place. It represents what Jesus said. We, we, we are not a race. We're the body of Christ. So I don't mess with all that nonsense, that blowhard preacher talk nonsense. So we don't throw out a little bit for everybody. I'm a little bit rock and roll. That's fine. That's just me. That's what I, Be you. Just be you. Enjoy the ride. Learn something about truth and values. Treat people respectfully. And don't make a church. Don't build it on a political party. And don't build it on a race. And don't build it on a nationality. Because you just violated the word of God and the will of God. And we're walking through a story right now where a man had a problem with that. And God says, well, you're going to have to get over it because I, God, do not change. You better change or you're going to be in trouble. Well... So I've got junk inside me, you've got junk inside you, and God wants to scrape that off. Sometimes we forget about it. And so we come to church, we get warm feelings about God, then we go out into the real world and we think, well, I'm not sure about you, and I'm not sure about them. You know, I tell this every, every couple of weeks, everybody's welcome here. I don't care if you're on a strip pole at a men's club. I don't care if you're a gay couple. Now, when it comes to leadership, there are some pretty strict requirements. I obey those. I have a pledge to obey God's word. But when it comes to friendship and inclusion, you're welcome. You're very welcome. I'm very happy to give you a hug. I'm very happy to love you. I'm very happy for you. I want you to feel comfortable and loved. And the only thing that can change any of us is God Almighty. His Holy Spirit's the only thing that can make me do a right thing. The only thing. So I'm trying to say to you, that was the, that's why Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Do you think these people were having a Bible study? When Jesus showed up, they weren't having a Bible study. You had prostitutes. You had pimps that were parked, hooking around the, the escorts. You got extortioners like these tax collectors. They extorted from their own people uh, over and above what the Roman government tax was. Try that, IRS. And they just gouged you. They were hated by their own people. And they, they had immoral people. These are the people Jesus went over and ate with. And he changed some of their lives forever. It was always about the heart, not about a law. The Pharisees go to the temple. Oh, God, I thank you. I'm white. Oh, God, I thank you. I'm Jewish. Oh, God, I thank you. I've never committed adultery. I thank you. I've never been drugged. I thank you. I've never looked at a naked woman. I, I think you're crazy. I think, I thank you. I've never murdered anybody. I thank you, and then I'm not like him, the publican. Here's how the publican prayed. He put his head down, beat his breast, and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And Jesus is standing over there with real life, and he says, okay, boys, we're having class right now. Which one went home justified in God's sight? And it wasn't the Pharisee. It was the humble publican who said, I stink. Have mercy on my stinkiness, Lord. God says, that'll do. Come on in. I like that. Because you're not going to achieve righteousness by what you do or what you haven't done. It's something God gives you as a gift through his meritorious work at the cross. Period. 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 We used to sing a song in the Baptist church when I was a kid growing up. I doubt any of the young adults will have ever heard it, but it's pretty simple. It says, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Lots of room at the cross. Foot of the cross hadn't run out of room in 2,000 years because that's the heart of God, to make space for anybody and everybody. Maybe you've never been to the foot of the cross before. Well, maybe today's your day. I just want you to know there's plenty of room for you. You can come to the cross and say like we've said, God, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I understand Jesus died for me. I understand about your forgiveness, and I want to follow you and receive you for the rest of my life. There's room for you today. For 2,000 years, people all over the world have been signing up. There's supposed to be a redemptive community that lives at the foot of the cross called the church. And that's you and me. Room for everybody. And we only have one message. There's room at the cross for you. And there's room in my heart for you. We're part of a community that for 2,000 years had nothing, but they would say to people, we've got almost nothing, but what we have is yours too. There's room for you. Come on in with us. You can come on in. So who's God calling you to make space for? What is it in that exclusive spirit in your heart God wants to rub out? People who don't dress right, talk right, look right, act right, vote right. Maybe it's somebody in your family or at work on your neighborhood, some group you read about in the newspaper. God calls that sin. It just wrecks the heart of God. I close with this story from Dave Galloway. I shared it once before many years ago, but it is really heart touching. And he tells the story about a teacher named Gene Thompson and a student named Teddy Stollard. He was disinterested in school, wore wrinkled clothes, hair never combed, unattractive, unmotivated, distant, and just plain hard to like. Even though his teacher said she loved everybody in her class, she wasn't really being truthful. Every time she marked Teddy's papers, she got a perverse pleasure putting X's next to the wrong answers. And when she put an F at the top of the paper, she did it with flair. She should have known better. She had Teddy's records. She knew more about him than she wanted to admit. And the records read first grade. Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but a poor home situation. Second grade. Teddy could do better. His mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy's a good boy, but too serious. He's a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well-behaved. His father shows no interest. Well, Christmas came, and the boys and girls in Miss Thompson's class brought her presents, put them on her desk, crowded around to watch her open them. Among them was one from Teddy Stollard. It was wrapped in brown paper with scotch tape. And on the paper were the simple words for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing, a bottle of cheap perfume. Other boys and girls started to giggle and smirk over Teddy's gifts, but Miss Thompson at least had enough sense to silence them by putting on the bracelet, putting some of the perfume on her wrist, and holding it up for the other children to smell. She said, doesn't this smell lovely? And the children, taking their cue from the teacher, readily agreed. At the end of the day, when school was over, all the children had left, Teddy lingered behind. He slowly came over and said softly, Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks real pretty on you, too. I'm glad you like my presence. When Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her. Next day, when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a brand new teacher. Miss Thompson had become a different person. She was now committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live on after her. She helped all the children, but especially the slow ones, and especially Teddy Stollard. By the end of the school year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement. He had caught up with most of the class and students and was ahead of some. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. 
Then one day she got a note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. I'll be graduating second in my class. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, another note came. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know the university hasn't been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the seventh to be exact. I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stollard. See, in the kingdom, people make space for people they don't have to make space for. And one day, God did that for you, and God did that for me. And God asks all of us, will you do that for the people I send into your life? Will you do that? Amen.